many of you here live today for our uh, Tourism eSchool webinar. And so we've got Paige here and hey I to see Rebecca. And it's actually fantastic to see lots of very familiar faces mm. here today, everyone. So, which is wonderful. Before we jump in, can I just have a quick raise of hands just to confirm in the in the control panel, just to confirm that you can hear us all okay, uh, would be fantastic. Thank you, Audrey. Thanks, Rose. Awesome, thank you, Rose. Hello from awesome. Norfolk. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks, Anna. Awesome, Perfect. so all good. So Paige and I will turn our webcams off in a moment um, before we jump in, but just quickly, so today's webinar will probably go for about an hour, but we absolutely encourage you as we go through today to have a think and love to hear also your thoughts and ideas on what we're talking about. If you've had examples of what's worked well or maybe hasn't worked so well from mm. a stakeholder and community engagement point of view. Also, as with all things tech, if we do have any tech issues, um, Paige will take over from myself or vice versa. Paige is also going to present um, the second half of today, but it is being recorded. So if we do have any issues today, uh, you will get a copy of the replay, but all going well, tech will hold out. Uh, which is great. So awesome. we'll turn our webcams off now and we will jump on in. So again, thanks again everyone for being here today. So a bit of background on uh, today's uh, webinar. So this is a workshop that Paige and I ran a couple of weeks ago at the Australian Regional uh, Convention uh, down in Devonport, Tasmania and it had a really fantastic feedback from everyone that came along to it which is why we decided to run it again today. The reason we've put this presentation uh, together is, um, I guess for those of you who know us and most of you here do, we originally started our business as doing, um, I guess, industry training for operators. So sort of in digital marketing, but over the last, sorry, four years, we've increasingly been doing a lot more strategic tourism plans and marketing plans for regions. And what we've found is that you can have the best strategic plan in the world or best great new brand or new campaign. But if you don't have sort of that buy-in from your wider community, uh, it can be an absolute challenge. So that's why we wanted to put this um, training together today, just to share some ideas on how you can improve it. So essentially, why does community understanding of tourism actually matter? So when it comes to uh, stakeholder engagement, we're usually pretty good at this. So you're, I know you're all a different mix. So we've got a number of local government here today, also regional tourism operators and also some consultants as well. So we're usually very good at consulting all these different uh, stakeholders who we can see on the screen. But the thing is we've often forget some of the other key ones. So all councils in regions, so not just those that are really invested in tourism, uh, the residents, other industry associations, for example, wine or agriculture, uh, even local progress associations and local businesses. So these guys are all as important part of your visitor economy as the core ones, and we really need to see them as an extension of your tourism team. So what happens if we, you know, if there isn't that buy-in and there's lack of understanding and engagement from these different uh, community groups? So first up with council uh, and elected members, executives, and those that are in other departments with the council that aren't visitor economy facing. Big challenges you find, and we've seen this very much ourselves as you firstly will have that shifting goalpost with your strategic direction. So they, you know, visitor economy is not a huge focus for them and, you know, funding and things like that will change. And you really struggle to maintain those um, funding and resources for tourism now and also for future plans as well. Also for council, you know, if they don't understand the value, they may give sort of nil or low priority to visitor economy, things like infrastructure, capital works and policy, which impacts the visitor experience in a region. And also apathy and ignorance to the potential that the visitor economy and tourism can bring to their region. Um, from an operator point of view, they're usually pretty on board, but again, if we don't have full collaboration, with them, you know, they can, you can see the results of this through things like lack of engagement with your campaigns, events, membership and activities, depending on your different things happening in your region. Also lack of understanding of marketing best practice and their subsequent impact. So they're actually, you know, not sharing the best brand experience for visitors, uh, which is not great because that's a really important marketing aspect for regions. Uh, they can also be complacency. And also, you know, the, the ultimate is, you know, closure of their business or jobs loss because, you know, they are evolving their business to keep up with, um, you know, where the market and customers are changing. Uh, with other industry associations, if we don't have them on board, 
we can have challenges such as lack of unification and duplication or dilution or um, of brand and reputation if they're off doing different things that aren't aligned with sort of what your destination is all about. Definitely duplication and wasted resources. We've seen this in a recent region we've just worked with. So they've got wine association going off doing all sorts of different things. Um, you know, lots of money that was sort of diluting the tourism uh, efforts. A siloed effort and communication, another really big challenge as well. Um, with locals, if we don't have them on board, they are such important um, stakeholders because for many of us, visiting friends and relatives are really important visitor groups uh, to our region. So we absolutely must have our local residents on board uh, and understanding the value of the visitor economy and the importance of welcoming visitors to our communities. Because again, if we don't have them on board, there's things like we see this residents that are sort of, you know, there's not much to do around here sentiment. They're not being those word of mouth advocates. They also can become a bit disgruntled with, you know, their local government spending money on tourism uh, over and above other things like looking after, you know, their roads and rubbish. You know, they see that the visitor economy is taking budget away from things that they want done. Visitors get priority over the local residents, which is not great. They can also have negative perceptions of visitors, especially in areas where there's potential for over tourism at sort of peak times of years, particularly. And again, worst, you know, the real impact of that is that we don't want visitors, which is not fantastic either. Um, for town, town committees, again, these guys are often really important because they're on the ground looking after sort of the visitor experience at local towns. If you don't have them on board, you know, you can have lack of buy-in with your campaigns and activities. They can be quite siloed focused. They can be lack of strategic direction and they can actually be sort of what is seen as annoying sort of thorns in your side due to their lack of understanding from visitor economy. So again, there's lots of consequences if we don't have these guys on board. So for the rest of today, what Paige and I are going to share with you is seven different sort of strategies or ideas that we have uh, to engage your communities. So with all these different ideas, these are some of our own, but we have also spoken to a few different um, industry leaders around Australia based on you know, consultants or regions that are also doing great things in this space. So again, we'll share those where uh, we come across them. So the first strategy I'm going to cover with you is the importance of consultation. So what we're talking about here is not just that token consultation, really in-depth consultation and making sure we close the loop on our consultation and make sure that we finish off projects and keep community updated. So essentially, if you want to see what backlash or disengagement from industry and local community looks like, then please just don't consult them when you're making major decisions in the visitor economy. And this is a recent example down in Hobart. So a recent proposal with um, you know, master planning for Mount Wellington and building cable cars up to the summit. There was massive protests from the local community because they had not felt uh, involved or engaged in the planning process for that tourism development. So again, you might be thinking, you know, we do consultation well in our regions, but I wanted to share an example of what real consultation success can look like. And this is heading back down to Tasmania. So some of you may have heard about this uh, example or case study already, but uh, this time last year, West Coast Council, which is sort of on the west coast of uh, Tasmania, so covering sort of Strawn, Zian areas, they decided to go through a rebrand. And their main goal for this rebrand was not just to grow tourism, but to actually grow the population in their community. And what they realised for the key success factors um, was they really needed to get some outside help in. So there were many, well, I think it was over 100 different agencies bid on the project and the successful agency was We Are The People. And so we caught up with Jason Little, who was the, you know, one of the project team. And we said to him, look, you know, how did this project work so well? So he said the key part of it was, it was absolutely immersive community engagement. And from the get go, they saw the success of this new rebrand was basically, you know, very, very extensive community engagement. They basically, he and his team embedded themselves in the community and they consulted with all 4,000 people that lived in the community. So they basically promoted their, they had working groups, evening meetings, that sort of stuff. They promoted that out on all the different local media channels, radio, Facebook groups, shop windows. Every one of the five towns in the region had a workshop. They also had heaps of one-on-one -on -one meetings with all the different people, not just tourism, but local residents, um, all that sort of thing. 
they had around 40 hours and nine days of one-on-one -on -one and those sort of group community meetings, which is, you know, exhaustive and really impressive. Um, part of the process too, so after that process of all the catch-up and stakeholder engagement, they then um, came up with their first round of the new brand for them. And so what they did was they put together a drop-in showcase. So in each of the towns, they popped up uh, an example of sort of the stories and how the new brand was going to look like to get their feedback. Uh, as it was developed. And what I want to show here is also just a short video which really tells the story of the project and then I'll share a few more of the outcomes. So fingers crossed the audio works okay for your end. So I'm just hopefully you can hear it all okay. Quite remote and isolated here. Ah, uh, the weather on the west coast is predictably unpredictable because it's either extremely good or extreme. Whoops, sorry. Matt, play. Extremely bad. Be prepared. Wear gumboots. Bring your umbrella. And we have gravel ovals. You know that's how tough we need to be. <sighs> you can get skin torn off you. No worries. If if you can't buy it, you make it. If you can't make what you want, you make do. So hopefully you got the full impact of that video, but if not, uh, we'll have the link um, and really encourage you to watch it because it's really quite incredibly inspiring. Um, so when we caught up with Jason, we sort of said there's a lot of case studies around this, um, this, the success of this project. But when we caught up with him, we really said, look, tell us what were some of the key game changers for really getting that community engagement uh, on this project? And what he shared with us was firstly, they were really lucky that the council and elected members were also the residents as well. They are very long-term residents, very passionate, and they really embraced this project. They um, took them all around to meet all the different locals. And again, also that exhaustive, you know, 40 hours of consultation and really listening to all the community and the community really felt very heard. Another really important tip Jason sh uh, shared was that they used the right framing words. They never once talked logo, they never once talked the word brand. So it was very much talking about what this process was going to bring to the region. So, you know, hopefully more jobs and, um, you know, economic benefits to the community was really what they talked about. They were also very transparent in the whole journey. So they've kept the whole community updated as they went through and each time they sort of had new brand creative rollout, they informed the community at the same time as they informed the council as well, which is very brave. So a few frequently asked questions, and this one was the first one <laughs> that I asked and said, well, that must have cost them a fortune. But essentially what he said was that the, you know, no one has that sort of money. And council built a, a very strong business case for this um, project. And so they were able to access uh, grants, which helped fund the project. Also really importantly was they sourced funding for the implementation. So almost the same amount of budget again as what they spent on the actual brand. And that was super important. So they actually had the money to then roll out the websites, you know, the creative and industry training and that sort of stuff around it as well. So this new brand has been rolled out 
were going incredibly successfully and it's now underpinning new investment confidence in the region because um, you know the wider Tasmanian government and state growth has seen the investment there uh, and you know it's giving investors confidence to come in and you know things like looking at the region now as one of the new great walks in Tasmania because of it. So if you'd like to read more, uh, there's a bit.ly link, uh, bit.ly forward slash for, uh, West Coast Taz, which links you through to some of the Medium blog articles, which shares more about that. But, you know, lots more details around how they got that community on board through consultation. So bringing it back to you guys, with consultation, really anytime you're doing any sort of strategic planning projects, tourism strategy or branding or even new campaigns, just make sure you allow time and budget for that comprehensive face-to-face -face consultation and not just token stuff, not just a survey, if you can, you know, the face-to-face -face and talking to people. Also really important to engage on the medium of whoever you're engaging with. So, you know, whether it's face-to-face -face or that sort of thing as well. You know, if they're not on Facebook, don't be on Facebook. If they're not on Twitter, don't be on Twitter. If they are on the local radio, uh, engage with them that way. Also, again, be very careful, watch your words and frame very carefully and focus on the benefits of what's in it for them. Uh, and not too much tourism speak, which you're often very good at. Uh, keep it transparent. And really, finally, very, very important is we absolutely must keep them updated on our strategic projects. So the, when we're thinking about you know, any planning in our roles or organisations, often we have the new project, this is the ideal. Uh, stakeholder consultation, we do the draft, get some feedback, do the final project, and then update everyone at the end. But often, Two bits that sometimes don't doesn't happen is the updating and that stakeholder feedback as we go through. So um, this was catching up with Linda Tilma from the Tilma Group. She said, you know, her words were, we must close the loop when it comes to doing this sort of stuff. Because if we don't, you'll find that next project that you have and you go out to your community, that you have frustration and disengagement because they'll say, well, look, we, we shared feedback on this project X and we've never heard anything about it. So why should we engage with this new project uh, as well? So really important to close the loop for any consultation projects as well. Um, so love to hear in the chat box if anyone has got any examples of um, seeing this working well or not working well with um, community uh, consultation with sort of their stakeholders. Um, so pop them in there if you've got uh, questions and we'll come back and share them in a moment. Um, the number two strategy that I'll continue on with is making sure that we have a stakeholder communication plan and we are sharing the right message on the right channel. So again, when it comes to, you know, getting community engagement and buy-in comms are really, really important. We usually do these ones very well. So we're pretty good at keeping our operators, uh, visitor centres, local tourism organisations, RTOs um, up to date. But for the rest, often it's quite reactive. You know, it's only when we need to do it. So local businesses, residents, progress associations, all council and wider industry groups. We need to be really proactive with these guys as well. A few reasons why we need to do this is, again, it can change and influence hearts and minds when it comes to the importance of the visitor economy in our regions, and more likely to help get their buy-in for visitor economy projects at all level of community. Also helps keep them engaged and involved in projects. Um, and also another one is communicating at the time of emergency or if you've got reputation management issues. And again, we all have natural disasters, that sort of thing's happening. So if we've got those channels in place, ready to go, then we can you know, move really quickly. And importantly, it can help build that positive reputation uh, across towns and regions and help reduce the parochialism, which we certainly see in some uh, smaller regions. So just as an example here, uh, Clare and Gilbert Valley Council is in a region we've done recent work with and can see here on their social media, they've just shared a post uh, on, they've just done recent Main Street updates and they had a post on their new bike racks and had overwhelming positive engagement um, from the local community uh, compared to other posts because it was sort of a good news story and there's lots of great community con conversation as well. So when it comes to stakeholder comms, again, for each of you, it's slightly different, but have a look at, you know, where do residents, local businesses and local community groups fit in your comms planning? And remember, attention is really hard to get. We must understand each of our audiences and uh, their goals as well. And our goals are what we want to communicate with them. And again, for you guys, for each of you, who are your key stakeholders and what are your key messages and key channels of how you can communicate with them? So um, essentially what all of you ideally will have is what I've put together here is an ugly uh, comms matrix. 
So this is just a really basic Excel spreadsheet I just popped together as an example, but something that shows all your different um, different stakeholders across the top, you know, local residents, elected members, internal council staff, BRC staff, operators, LTOs, local business industry associations, and then all the different channels and how, you know, what messages and how you're going to communicate with them as well. So it doesn't need to be anything fancy, um, just need to have it there. So again, with your residents specifically, having a think about where do they hang out, local paper, radio, social media, and share what's in it for them and also use it to close loops on projects that they've been consulted on. Again, this is an example coming back to Clare and Gilbert Valley Council um, in a region where we've done some uh, tourism work. And again, the local paper is in Northern Argus, so they're sharing good news stories there and also sharing good news stories uh, through their council Facebook page uh, as well, which is fantastic. Um, another example here is caught up with Catherine from um, Bundaberg Tourism. And she shared in Bundaberg, they have the Bundaberg now, um, basically media channel, which was as a result of council being sick of all the negative media coverage that they got. So they created their own channel for good news. And this has been an absolute hit uh, with the locals. So they can sort of share the good news stories, not just tourism, but sort of across the wider, all the other different things happening uh, in council. So that's been absolutely fantastic for them. Um, another example here is also Facebook groups or industry pages are fairly common uh, when it comes to regional and industry engagement. Just be aware with Facebook groups or also Facebook pages, if you're putting these together, you just have to be really aware of the Facebook algorithm and understand that reach is at around 5% of your community. So make sure you're only sharing posts that encourage conversations uh, and adding real value because otherwise they won't be seen. Another really important um, communication tool with industry is obviously e-news. Again, pretty much most regions do an e-news, but a few tips here is you want to keep them short, sharp, and very visual. Um, it's an example here from Cradle Coast. They do a fantastic visual one. Tips here is also keep it frequent is better than every few months, sharing a big essay, and test and tweak it as you would with a consumer e-news. Um, also visit Canberra, we really like their e-news as well. So you can sign up, see what they're doing. Just short, sharp and shiny with a link through to read a little bit more. So again, when it comes to communications as well, be really, really aware of your words. Again, we're very good at using acronyms and big words like you know, visitor economy, storytelling brand, but that doesn't necessarily mean a lot to people outside of the tourism industry. So again, talking to Catherine up at Tourism um, uh, Bundaberg, she basically said in there, um, and there as an RTO, they use the word tourism is new money when they're talking to councillors and residents and the local business community and makes it really clear that the value that visitor economy is bringing. So just be aware of your wording when you're talking to your different stakeholders. And also, so just wrapping up this section, um, caught up with Craig at the Australian Regional Tourism Convention a couple of weeks ago and he made the statement that ro rates, roads and rubbish and relationship really should be the focus when it comes to, um, especially at the local government level. So really you want to be putting as much effort into your local and industry communication plans as you do for your visitor facing uh, consumers as well. So again, have we got any um, feedback yet Paige or any conversation or uh, ideas that people have shared if they've seen this working well or not so well in their um, uh, part we, of the world? Yeah, so we just had a comment from Kushla from um, Tilma Group. She just said, just referring back to the consultation um, section she just said it's usually in that consultation phase that Tilma Group do for clients that the solutions are revealed and it's essential mm -hmm. in tourism development and she said that's the part that she loves the most so you know mm -hmm. um, you know that's where that phase is just so critical um, when you are trying to work out you know what the opportunities are but that's yep. it awesome thank you Krishla Awesome. All right. So um, strategy number three to help engage our local communities is collaboration. So I've got a great little quote here from uh, Henry Ford. Coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress and working together is success. So we know collaboration. I think we heard this word about 50 times at the Australian Regional Tourism Convention a couple of weeks ago. But collaboration really is where it's at with tourism, especially because we have so many different um, stakeholders in the visitor economies in each of our regions. Um, so there's a few different opportunities that we're talking specifically about. So first one is those cross-sector collaborations. So 
not just straight tourism, but looking across industries, so wine, food, agri, arts, heritage, niche interests, you know, huge opportunities there if there's organisations with budget talking to similar customers um, that we could collaborate with. And then also cross-regional collaboration for those of you uh, who are in a destination that's not so defined as a, someone like Rose in Norfolk, you're, that's pretty um, easy, but for a lot of regional Australia, you know, borders don't mean anything to our visitors. And got a really nice example here of uh, the Canola Trail. So again, Kushler and Linda were involved in this at Tilma Group. And basically I caught up with Linda and said, so how did the community engagement and what was the success behind this project? And she said, Linda shared that with all three councils initially, before they even got to the point of this project, they really, all three of them understood the value of tourism and they understood that visitors didn't care about boundaries. And so they had a really strong relationship in place first through their regular meetings and shared conversations. And they came together with a very clear purpose and objective, which was to leverage the opportunity from sort of the big regional centres and drive regional dispersal out into their council regions. So, the three of them teamed up together to put together the Canola Trail. So fantastic website and collateral uh, and itineraries that's really helped to develop their sort of little regional towns. And absolutely recommend you check out their um, work if you haven't seen that online as well. But collaboration, very, very powerful. The thing with collaboration though, we do need to be really realistic around the resourcing and governance and making sure that we're very clear on what we're trying to achieve and focused on a single goal for collaboration. Um, because again, Everyone's busy and you just need to have that very clear. You also may find you need an external person to um, brought in to sort of help bring these relevant parties together. Uh, again, often if you just get them in the same room, you know, the ideas and opportunities will flow, but you know, you could consider having that external person bring them together. Also when it comes to collaboration, often for some of us here today and listening in the replay, we have, uh, you might be in a bigger region and you've got smaller local tourism organisations, LTOs, or smaller towns, a part of your region. And you really want to bring them in under your sort of regional marketing and activities, but often we'll find that they really don't want to lose their identity and you know want to be hold on to their small little brochure or small website. Um, so it's really important that we educate them and share the relevant statistics of sort of where destination marketing is heading. Um, but at the same time, we want to be a partner with them, not a dictator. And really need to explain the resourcing reality. So the time and dollars it takes to maintain um, you know, a website and brochures and distribution and that sort of thing. Um, we really want them, you, ideally you want to encourage them to be the experts and storytellers for their little part of a particular region. And one way we can do this is through things like very clear memorandums of understanding, which makes it clear that what we will do and what they will do as well. And again, just as an example of how this looks in reality. So again, catching up with Catherine from uh, Bundaberg Tourism, Woodgate Beach, was, Beach is an example of a small community that falls in the wider Bundaberg region. And so they really still wanted to have their own brochure and their own website. So Catherine had caught up with them, uh, you know, explained that, you know, the realities, but they really still wanted to go ahead and do their own thing. So she left them to it for 12 months. Um, at the end of 12 months, um, she said, come back and tell us how you went. Into 12 months, their website had around 4,000 visits, whereas their Woodgate Beach page on the wider regional website had around 20,000 visitors. So using those statistics, she was able to explain and say, look, you know, we can help, you know, let's channel our efforts, put your time and effort and content into here and, you know, share through social media and tell the story of the community that way. Um, also, same for brochures as well. They had really wanted to keep doing their own brochure, their small little own brochure, but they were producing it, but they didn't have budget for distribution. Whereas again, they explained that Bundaberg Tourism was spending $18,000 per annum on brochure distribution. So they've now managed, um, again, working in, you know, close working relationship and collaborating. They've now got them advertising in their wider South Great Barrier Reef guide in lieu of their own brochure, which is better use of their time and effort um, as well. And they're now getting that wider, um, you know, wider dispersal through the visitor guide, which gets the, you know, much greater distribution. So again, this is where memorandum of understanding can be really powerful to help sort of facilitate this sort of collaboration. So you can do an MOU with pretty much anyone. Um, so in your region, it could be local tourism organisation or regional tourism organisation, transport partners, industry associations. And all it does is it's essentially explaining what we will do and what you will do. It's a signed non-binding non and voluntary agreement. And 
you can pretty much pop in there whatever you like. So things like, you know, marketing, resourcing, industry development meetings, um, that sort of thing that you want to achieve. And a good MOU really is an outcome of that consultation uh, and communication. So again, love to hear or let you to have a think about how can you encourage more collaboration in your region between your different visitor uh, economy stakeholders. So Paige, I'm going to hand over to Paige now for yeah. um, the next little bits. So Paige, I'll just hand over to you. All going well? Yep. Um, bear with us. It's just easier to uh, easier to turn through the um, the PowerPoint presentation when you're in control. <laughs> so we just uh, cool, you're get on and do it. So okay. You're here we go. All right. So um, the fourth uh, key strategy um, as it relates to trying getting our communities on board, obviously, uh, is to activate our local groups um, and our residents because these guys are our region's biggest untapped resource as it relates to, you know, building advocates and, and driving um, visitation. So um, in the... Um, examples that we're sharing today and also you know just what we've learned over the time there are a couple of ideas that we've come up with and um, case studies again in this area so um, to be able to activate these groups um, a really good idea would be um, once you've developed a strategy instead of sort of um, saying to everyone oh this is the strategy and here's the 10 key pillars and, and that type of thing bring it back down to the actionable things that people can actually do to um, you know activate um, the strategy on, you know, in their capacity. So stakeholder checklists for any of your tourism strategies or even um, the promotion of events is a really great idea. So the Taste um, Bundaberg Festival um, had a little community checklist here which basically sort of sounded out all the ways that um, the tourism businesses can get on board to help promote the event through social media and also um, through collateral as well. Um, another idea is just to encourage really small and uh, quirky developments in public spaces um, throughout your region. So a great um, example here, and uh, these guys won um, the Toilet Tourism Awards last year, or this year, I can't remember, last year. But this is the um, Cummins Toilet Block, um, a very small country town just north of Port Lincoln on the Air Peninsula in South Australia. Um, what they did is uh, council approved um, for a very non-traditional tourism group, a group of ladies that do mosaics, uh, approved them to sort of tizzy up the um, local toilets. Um, and what they found was they ended up getting a whole, um, lots of different community groups involved in the project, like the schools and that type of thing, to help develop um, the little installations of the mosaics. Um, the whole concept around it was telling the story of their past um, and the history of the railways um, that go through the town. Um, and as a result, it sort of lifted morale um, and they now have that sort of long-term point of interest or attraction in their town, which, you know, and it, it's also won the award, the national award. So that's another sort of coup for them. But, yeah, it's just, you know, something that was a very 1980s sort of toilet block has turned into um, a bit of a tourist attraction for a town. Um, another little example of, you know, encouraging these um, developments is, you know, there's a lot of silo art going on at the moment, but how that sort of um, can be, um, I guess, um, grown into other types of art and public spaces. So um, one of my local towns here, uh, Kapunda, they um, have an amazing rich history um, in mining and the business chamber and community gallery um, uh, came together and also with some council support got approval um, to do all of these amazing murals um, across the town which really speak to the history um, of the town um, you know uh, which and also engage lots of different community groups as well um, another one is the Tummy Bay Progress Association so back over on Air Peninsula um, Basically, the association, Tumby Bay in itself is a very um, small, beautiful beachside town um, in South Australia and um, they should have a really great tourism offering but it's been a bit sleepy for a few years and so the Tumby Bay Progress Association sort of came up with the idea to um, get some um, silo art happening um, and they were encouraged by council um, to apply for Building Better Region funding to get um, an artist called Ron 
um, an international artist to come and paint their silos. And so they were successful in their Building Better Regions funding bid and they got to um, paint their silos. This is an upside down um, picture of two lads jumping off the jetty at Tumby. Um, and so what happened after that was um, they basically um, – asked a few uh, additional international artists and local artists too um, to participate in a really small event to paint um, five more street art installations across the town. So just on boring walls, um, shops and that type of thing. And what that actually turned into um, was an ongoing festival for the town um, and they had their second festival in 2019 and they've got another one planned for next year. And um, for some reason, here we go. This is the, just a little bit of a video. So you kind of get the kind of get the picture there. Um, so that obviously it gave the town a little bit more personality, and um, you know uh, they now are so um, engaged with each other in the Progress Association. They really back each other in, which has been really great for the community morale too. Um, Another great activation for these groups and, and locals is um, to develop tourism ambassador programs um, for visitor facing staff and locals as well. Um, so just as an example here, um, a group of high profile ex-residents from the Riverland in South Australia, um, they all had sort of this passion for the Riverland where they grew up and they wanted to help continue to support the region. So they um, teamed up with Destination Riverland and Destination Riverland, the RTO, and decided to pull together this sort of local ambassadors um, online training course. Um, and now they have over 125 ambassadors um, signed up and they, you know, get together regularly, net, net uh, working drinks, and they have, you know, their promotional um, campaigns and that going as well. Um, another great little example here is from Bendigo Tourism. They, again, have developed um, what is known as sort of like a local um, ambassador pass, which gives locals free entry and discounts for a range of different experiences when they bring along their visiting friends and relatives. Um, and I'll just play this uh, little video as well. Now, it's a little bit chip choppy at the start, but that's how it's sort of meant to be. Do you want to do this again next week? Yeah. Yes. So that's a great little um, promo, and uh, you know, just sort of showing that you know, the things that you probably that locals probably do already is show their you know friends and family around town. You can actually, you know, um, be encouraged a little bit more to 
you know, invite people up more often um, to, to um, you know, show them around our beautiful patches in region. Um, so another way to activate our, um, our little local groups and um, or local groups in particular is to sort of encourage them to package their sub-destination. So when we were talking to Jason Little about um, the uh, West Coast brand, he said when he came over on the, um, on the ferry over from Melbourne uh, to Devonport, he said that this brochure here, um, the Coast to Canyon brochure, um, which was a co-op marketing sort of piece that was facil facilitated by local government um, uh, but pulled together um, by the sort of uh, LTA, that little um, brochure itself was the most popular brochure on Spirit of Tasmania, um, as Jason sort of found out um, in his inquiries. So I just picked this up when we were over in Devonport for the, the conference the other week. But, yeah, so that in itself, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money. It's just getting activating these groups to pull together these, these types of um, opportunities. Um, and then finally, um, just some key ideas to get your um, residents um, engaged. A bit like the Bendigo uh, story um, of their ambassador program, um, the Margaret River region, they offer complimentary season passes to their lighthouse. So the actual um, RTO there run the lighthouse. Um, it's run by volunteers, but they obviously own it and, and manage it as a tourism product. They offer, um, uh, you know, their... Um, their locals free entry and so you know that encourages that visiting friends and relatives um, uh, visitor through as well as um, the Warrnambool residents with this Flagstaff Hill Maritime Village as well and you know it changed perceptions this particular one where you know anyone living with a, within Warrnambool City Council you know they could get um, free daytime entry into the village itself and you know the perception was that they had no idea that there were just so many great activities up there for families so you know it's educating locals as well as um, you know helping encourage them to bring visiting friends and relatives and become those advocates as well. Um, another example here is in my region, um, the Clare Valley Food and Wine, Food, Wine and Tourism Centre. They have their Friday night happy hour every Friday night without fail and they invite a local winemaker and a food producer. And this um, gets so much great local communities in uh, support um, and also is really engaging for industry. And it's a, it's a way where industry and community come together and have those conversations. Um, so a great way, you know, to educate as well. Um, another example here from Bendigo, um, we found that they have this new residence welcome kit that every new resident gets. Um, and this sort of welcome kit is in, available in at real estate agents um, through council and, and through employers as well. Um, in that kit, they've got a bit of a visitor guide, maps, social channels, um, uh, Facebook groups, hashtags, free offers, that type of thing. You can extend this out and, you know, really use it as a tool to be able to engage residents in the visitor economy as well. Um, uh, when we were at the conference, actually, the um, team that visit Sunshine Coast um, said that they have a very similar type um, um, uh, brochure type kit um, available for their new residents as well um, and they send it out annually to all residents not just new residents so that's not a, a bad idea just to get the reminder out there that you know um, how the visitor economy is helping them um, as well and help them to become advocates. So the key question here is how can we activate local communities to get involved in tourism and also for them to get out and about in region and become um, our destination advocates. So has anyone got any ideas about, you know, what you're currently doing in your region um, to activate your local groups um, uh, and or residents? Uh, nothing in the chat box. If anyone's game and wants to yeah. chat, you can put your hand up. We can take you off mute as well. So yeah. uh, keep that in mind. It looks like most of you, all of you could speak if you wanted as well. Yeah, great. If not, think, have a think about that and uh, we'll let you keep going, Paige, and we'll come yeah. back to any questions. Great. Um, so the, the fifth um, sort of idea or strategy is all around destination marketing. So, you know, we've got loads of um, stakeholders in our region, but we just need to make sure, you know, as leaders, you know, if we're local government or an RTO, we are leaders in the marketing space in terms of, you know, that consumer direct. So we need to be really clear that we've got everyone on board. 
and be strategic and try and pull everyone together under, you know, the one sort of banner so that we all know what the messaging is and all know how to activate that messaging um, in our destination. So um, I guess with marketing, the whole idea around collaborating and um, and getting everyone on the same page is to eliminate um, any sort of confusion from our visitors regarding what our values are and what our proposition is and what our, you know, cultural positioning is for our region and, and what our place DNA is. Also, you know, with marketing, if there's, you know, 25 groups doing 25 different things, um, having 10 different websites and, you know, 50 different social channels, it's all about how do we reduce that um, in terms of, you know, reducing the overwhelm um, and, you know, providing some sort of unity for um, our visitors so that, you know, they know that there's a couple of one-stop shops to get their inspiration and planning information um, as well. So um, a key thing also with marketing just to remember is that building great experiences will absolutely drive advocacy and which is the most trusted form of advertising and logo development won't. A lot of organisations actually spend a lot of time on um, logos when really it's all about um, developing those great experiences that get people talking um, and raving about um, the product in our region. So remembering that's the key goal of marketing. Um, so a couple of ideas here of how we sort of activate, you know, this type of strategy is to ensure that in anything that we do marketing-wise that we're really sensitive to local tourism issues. So, you know, respecting the local communities um, throughout your campaigns and, and don't sort of add problems to areas where there may be over-tourism. This is just a really um, uh, a simple story about Bruni Island, um, you know, over Easter time, they have, it, it's hard enough getting across the ferry um, over to Bruni Island, but this is just the reality when, you know, um, it's uh, when, you know, marketing could potentially um, promote uh, the island at a specific time. And then all of a sudden, these people in cars are having bad experiences. So it's about understanding um the landscape um, that you're working within um, and any other um, sort of parameters that we need to keep in mind, in mind um, when it comes to marketing and, and trying to get more people to a certain place in our region. Um, another idea is just, you know, make sure that whatever tactics that you are implementing, that you think about your town associations and groups and, and think about the ways in which they can actually leverage it. So, you know, using their resources, they want to proactively market, they want to proactively be part of the bigger picture. So what can you do or how can you structure your campaigns or structure your um, always on marketing activities to be able to bring them along for the ride and, and get their contribution? So that could be, you know, encouraging them to be guest blogging or, um, you know, uh, being a part of any sort of social media campaigns and, and how they can physically implement, help you implement um, what you're doing. Um, obviously, you know, driving VFR growth is huge. Um, so, you know, thinking about ways um, to market that engage locals as well. So, you know, different ideas are around sort of the Ask a Local campaigns, local ambassador programs, like what we said, and, you know, um, activating locals um, to be the ears and eyes on the ground. So when Rebecca was talking to Catherine at uh, Bundaberg, she said that they had their sort of visit Bundaberg um, hashtag, which is all about getting that sort of ongoing encouragement of locals to really share what's going on um, in their region um, you know, because they're the ones that often are experiencing it every day, day in, day out. Um, so, you know, encouraging them to be um, the ambassadors. So the question here is, can you provide a platform for all community groups to buy into when it comes to marketing your destination? You know, give everyone a role, make sure that they, you know, feel a part of it because um, they're more likely to become advocates and, and um, you know, really have a clear understanding of the value of tourism if they can um, you know, be a part of it. So is anyone sort of um, doing anything at the moment that sort of brings in um, these sort of community groups into uh, your marketing? What, not as yet, but I was, what I was also going to say too is no one's budget and resources are getting bigger. Um, yeah. And when it comes to destination marketing, really activating all these different um, groups on the ground really can help make them a wider part of your marketing team as mm. well. So you guys don't have to do it all in your role. So engaging all these different people, other, you know, they're local, local trusted voices for a particular region. So it's actually really smart marketing sense to bring these guys on board uh, mm. as well with your marketing. So mm, exactly. Yeah. 
Okay. Cool. No, back to your page. Yeah. So number six is um, building capability and confidence because we know that with confidence, people are able to, um, you know, be advocates and and confidently, um, you know, share the information about their destination. So a lovely little quote here from Nelson Mandela. He's a, you know, very smart man. Education is the most powerful weapon. So um, it's no different in destination. So, you know, why do we need to educate? Because informed people have the tools to become advocates. Um, you know, often we're really good at, you know, building capability and capacity with our industry. Um, but, you know, we often forget that we've got lots of other stakeholders like councils, elected members, you know, and other sort of key regional stakeholders that might not specifically be in the tourism space, but, you know, could potentially be great advocates um, for tourism as well. So some sort of key ideas here. It's a no-brainer. Everyone probably does it, just networking events, um, just being mindful, obviously, of time and locations, um, you know, even though we, we struggle with this as well when we're um, hosting any kind of event, it's kind of like, well, daytime is great, morning time is better because everyone's fresh, but then, you know, people have full-time jobs to consider as well and people running tourism businesses are mum and dad tourism operators and um, that type of thing, so we've got to be mindful of that. Um, for meals, so having um, familiarisations across different sectors um, and even across different local government areas is really great to enhance that understanding um, of what product and experiences are actually out there um, and also, you know, um, you know, you know, uh, getting people on that same page that um, visitors don't see boundaries. So how can, you know, LGAs sort of, you know, work together and understand others patch a little bit better uh, as well? Um, just as an example here, the Riverland, back to the Riverland, they have a really great um, initiative called the Tourism Exchange and this is where businesses um, and visitor centre staff, they catch up um, to meet and talk about um, their products and talk about packaging opportunities. Um, everyone's all in the same room, it's a bit like speed dating, a really fantastic initiative that um, is, you know, building on the conversations and trying to get people um, around each other and, and build that sort of value um, uh, with each other. Because often there's lots of people in a region that, you know, that, uh, associate with, um, you know, an RTO or a, a membership-based organisation, but they rarely actually, into, like, um, chat to each other. So these sorts of forums are actually really amazing. Then the next one, obviously, is uh, elected body education. And, you know, this is all about building relationships and educating to create those advocates at that, that LGA level. Um, you know, these guys are inherently parochial, so we need to leverage that to get them really passionate about their little patch um, in the region. So um, just as an example here, Rebecca and I, we um, worked with Light Regional Council um, to develop a tourism plan. Now, they hadn't had a tourism plan done for a little while. Um, they are very much, an, uh, they see themselves very much as an agricultural industry. They have probably a third of their um, council boundaries is sits in the Barossa. Um, so, uh, and in in fact, it's along Sepultsfield sort of area, Greenock area, which is, you know, one of the, ha has some of the biggest um, uh, Barossa wine brands and tourism brands. So, um, what was really interesting is before we actually started doing the consultation, the local tourism organisation um, took the elected members, it was, you know, very ripe for the picking, they took the elected members on a bus ride around Sevilsfield Road and some of the key um, experiences there. Um, they had really low awareness of what the tourism product was um, and so for them it was a pretty low priority but they were, they were really keen to have a look around and, and see what happened. From, from doing that, they were absolutely blown away by what they learned and what they saw. Um, they, you know, came away with a better understanding of the investment. So, you know, the business owners talked about, you know, the investment that they've made in their product and um, and what, you know, their export numbers were and um, what visitor sort of numbers were. They now have a really good understanding of the challenges uh, for tourism and the outcome of that, and even though it was sort of in in, tra in train already but you know they really got behind the new tourism plan that Rebecca and I um, 
pulled together. And, uh, you know, within the same year, they employed um, a full-time tourism manager as well. And, and they hadn't had a full-time tourism manager for quite some time. So that was a, some really great outcomes um, from that. But one of the best outcomes was um, that councillor, Dean Rolak, he was always sort of a um, tourism advocate, but he absolutely got behind it. And, you know, even to this day, he updates everyone in his um, in his electorate um, on what is happening. So, you know, any events that are happening, um, any updates to infrastructure that are happening, and he's getting some really amazing um, engagement on his social platforms. And he's now, you know, a really fantastic advocate for tourism in the in the community. He's really well known, and he's getting he's sort of reaping the benefits um, that way too. So, you know, he is inherently parochial. He's getting behind a real cause, and you know, um, the region is really flourishing because of that. So it's a it, it's one of those things we just need to be really aware of um, the, how passionate our um, elected members are and how we can really get them to, to be the voice for tourism. So I guess, you know, with this, like the key question is what, what can stakeholders, uh, what stakeholders can you get, uh, can you help to build the capacity um, and confidence in your destination? Um, anyone got any uh, amazing ideas of how you've... Uh, implemented this type of um, strategy? Uh, and let's have a look. Any hands? No? All good. But again, this is, I think this this little bit that Paige has covered has been a massive game changer for a lot of the strategies we do as well. And is now part of very much what we do with tourism plans because it just makes such a difference. So yeah. definitely some, something for you all to have a think about as well. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Back to you, Paige. Okay. So the last strategy is obviously investing in measurement. Um, so the whole idea about investing in measurement is, you know, typically we've got um, lots of data available from Tourism Research Australia um, and um, our own state bodies as well. We get, you know, the, the baseline visitor numbers, um, engagement, uh, well, get, get the baseline visitor numbers from those organisations. But what we really need to be measuring is engagement and sentiment as well from our visitors, um, you know, and not when we're communicating these numbers and these statistics, we need to sort of turn it around and kind of think about what do these stats actually mean for our communities. So that they, they, they don't know the difference between a million visitors and a million two hundred visitors, um, or, or slowly slow progressive growth in um, expenditure, that type of thing. What we we have to kind of think about the wording and the framing of that kind of like what Rebecca was saying earlier we need to start speaking in the language of our community so does it mean jobs for their kids does it mean that you know our main street businesses you know can stay open or you know maybe some negative sentiment around parking on main street so you've got heaps of visitors but everyone's struggling with parking so thinking about what um measurement um uh, mechanisms you have in place and then what you need to be able to communicate. So if you don't, if you can't measure visitor sentiment or engagement in, you know, um, your activities, then how are you going to measure that? And then from there, how are you actually going to communicate it as well? So like I said, all of this information is really important, but for the average community member, it doesn't mean a whole lot um, because they've got nothing to benchmark it against and they're not going to look into benchmarking. Um, so, um you know, looking at things like visitor sentiment as well um, will absolutely help you to get a bit more of an understanding of what our visitors are saying, which, again, helps us to um, understand what advocacy is out there um, for our destinations. So, again, the right stats with the right story around it can absolutely help show the value that our visitor economy is bringing to our regions and all of its stakeholders, including, um, you know, our local residents. So that is the end of our webinar. And just to recap, because there's lots going on. Um, so we had the seven strategies of how to engage our communities. So the first is obviously uh, consultation and consultation and collaboration um, uh, were huge at the ARTN conference, the Australian Regional Tourism Conference that we went to a couple of weeks ago. So it's a real issue, um, but it's a real opportunity too. So with consultation, make sure it's absolutely real and we close that loop. With stakeholder comms, you know, we need to make sure that we invest in chatting to our local 
um, community groups and our residents um, and other stakeholder groups, you know, more than just an e-news, let's talk real with them, let's have that ongoing conversation with them rather than just sporadically um, and collaboration and thinking just, uh, not just thinking inside of our own tourism ministry, but how we can leverage what um, is going on outside of that industry. Um, act great, activating groups and our residents as well to become advocates um, with our marketing, making sure we focus on experience and allow our community groups to leverage what we're doing and encourage them to leverage it too. Build confidence and capability, um, educate widely and frequently and, you know, build those um, parochial advocates um, and then measure and report on what matters in, in the language that means something to our communities. So that's it, guys. Is there any questions or comments or even um, ideas that you'd like to share? Uh, um, so thank you. Kushla's just shared. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Um, we'll be sharing the slides too. I'll definitely recommend others to watch the webinar. So thanks, Kushla. We re um, we've recorded today and we'll be sharing it up and on a blog article uh, in the next, um, probably next few days, which we'll have a link to a lot of the resources that we've talked about as well. So mm. you can then share it to anyone that wasn't able to make it live today. Yeah. So yes, any other, let's have a look at a few other things here. Perfect. Uh, all right, thanks everyone for your feedback. That's yeah. uh, really great. So yeah. thank you so much for your time. We know everyone's busy um, yeah. and we're always on help at tourismeschool.com if you want to reach out or um, got any other things to add to the conversation from today as well. Yeah. So thanks Perfect. for your time and uh, appreciate your uh, efforts to come along today. Cheers. See, See you, everyone. Bye.